Let us begin in prayer. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. On this your night of grace, O Holy Father, accept this candle, a solemn offering, the work of bees and of your servants' hands, an evening sacrifice of praise, this gift from your most holy church. Therefore, O Lord, we pray you that this candle, hallowed to the honor of your name, may persevere undimmed to overcome the darkness of this night. Receive it as a pleasing fragrance and let it mingle with the lights of heaven. May this flame be found still burning by the morning star, the one morning star who never sets, Christ, your son, who coming back from death's domain has shed his peaceful light on humanity and lives and reigns forever and ever, amen. Good and gracious God, I just praise you and thank you for the light, the light of Christ. And I ask your blessing and your Holy Spirit to be with whoever is watching this presentation. May their hearts be open to hear you calling them into relationship with them. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Father, Son, Holy Spirit. Amen. A reading from the prophet Baruch. Hear, O Israel, the commandments of life. Listen, and know prudence. How is it, Israel, that you are in the land of your foes, grown old in a foreign land, defiled with the dead, accounted with those destined for the netherworld? You have forsaken the fountain of wisdom. Had you walked in the way of God, you would have dwelt in enduring peace. Learn where prudence is, where strength, where understanding, that you may know also where are length of days and life, where light of eyes and peace. Who has found a place of wisdom? Who has entered into her treasuries? The one who knows all things knows her. He has probed her by his knowledge. The one who established the earth for all time and filled it with four-footed beasts. He who dismisses the light and it departs, calls it, and it obeys him trembling, before whom the stars at their posts shine and rejoice. When he calls them, they answer, Here we are, shining with joy for their Maker. Such is our God, no other to be compared to him. He has traced out the whole way of understanding, and has given her to Jacob his servant, to Israel his beloved son. Since then she has appeared on earth and has moved among people. She is the book of the precepts of God, the law that endures forever. All who cling to her will live, but those will die who forsake her. Turn, O Jacob, and receive her. Walk by her light toward splendor. Give not your glory to another, your privileges to an alien race. Blessed are we, O Israel, for what pleases God is known to us. A reading from the prophet Ezekiel. The word of the Lord came to me, saying, Son of man, when the house of Israel lived in their land, they defiled it by their conduct and deeds. Therefore I poured out my fury upon them, because the blood that they poured out on the ground, and because they defiled it with idols. I scattered them among the nations, dispersing them over foreign lands. According to their conduct and deeds, I judged them. But when they came among the nations wherever they came, they served to profane my holy name, because it was said of them, These are the people of the Lord. Yet they had to leave their land. So I have relented because of my holy name, which the house of Israel profaned among the nations where they came. Therefore, say to the house of Israel, Thus says the Lord God, Not for your sakes do I act, house of Israel, but for the sake of my holy name, which you profaned among the nations to which you came. I will prove the holiness of my great name, profaned among the nations, in whose midst you have profaned it. Thus the nation shall know that I am the Lord, says the Lord God, when in their sight I prove my holiness through you. For I will take you away from among the nations, gather you from all the foreign lands, and bring you back to your own land. 
I will sprinkle clean water upon you to cleanse you from all your impurities, and from all your idols I will cleanse you. I will give you a new heart and place a new spirit within you, taking from your bodies your stony hearts and giving you natural hearts. I will put my spirit within you and make you live by my statutes. Careful to observe my decrees. You shall live in the land I gave your fathers. You shall be my people, and I will be your God. Good evening. I can't believe we are in Holy Week already, and we are in our fifth week, and just uh, tremendous. And we are about to finish up the Old Testament readings for for the Easter Vigil. So we've gone, we've done Genesis, we've done Exodus, we've done Isaiah, and we're about to finish up with some profound readings. So because we are literally the Monday before the Easter Vigil. Janine, can you give us just a little bit of a synopsis of what we've gone through and how this is all tying into the movement of Holy Week? Mm. It's really quite, isn't it? And it's been, I don't know I, if it's touched anybody the way it's touched me. I mean, we've all been so blessed by this exploration of these readings. And the church really has invited us to journey through salvation history as we've taken, you know, been exposed to these readings. It's preparing us in a way to, you know, enter into that. I don't know, I can only think of it as an explosion of the Paschal mystery and uh, the resurrection. Because we are a resurrection people, and we must never forget that. We are people who live in the joy of the resurrection. And so our salvation is grounded in the whole Paschal mystery, the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus. And of course, the promise that he will come again. Remember the memorial acclamation that we say every Sunday, every liturgy, Christ has died, Christ is risen, Christ will come again. It's not over, yeah. you know? Yep. So Bridget, I thought it might be interesting. Why don't you put up the first slide that we have just to take a look at the themes that have run through these readings. Um, that have taken us, you know, see, the Vigil Old Testament readings, this is a rescue mission, right? God has taken us from darkness to light, think about Genesis now, from order out of chaos, so he's taken us from chaos to order. Think about the Abraham story, the confusion to the promise, I'll say a little more about that in a minute. Okay. Exodus, oppression to freedom. The Isaiah read, grief to restoration, thirst to abundant water. The two we'll be looking at tonight, the path of folly to the path of wisdom, from a hard heart to a new heart. So let's see how this happens. Take that down, Bridge. <clears throat> Let me see what God's doing, because I'd rather look at you than the slide. You understand <laughs> what I'm saying? Yeah. So we started with the creation account, where we see God, like I said, bringing darkness and order out of chaos. Darkness, light out of darkness and order out of chaos. And this, this is a thread, you know, that runs mm -hmm. through all of these readings. Yes. It actually runs through the whole of the Old Testament. And it can be summed up in the idea of God at work doing these things. God at work, bringing hope from fear, bringing order from chaos. The second reading that we looked at a few weeks back, the story of Abraham and Isaac, very powerful and moving story. Yes. We see God bringing life from potential death, huh? fulfilling the promise that was given. And what does this do? This assures the community, a community that God is with us and is for us. It's a profound story. And if you remember, what does it do? It highlights the faith of Abraham. Yes the father of faith, and it was credited to him as an act of righteousness. It was seen by God as something very good. And, you know, we're not talking about moral goodness here. We're talking about good in the way in which God spoke about good when he looked at creation. Remember? Yep. He said it was good. Then he said it was very good. What did that mean? 
it meant that it was what it was supposed to be. It was able to do what it was supposed to do. It was in order, not disorder. It was in a right relationship with God, with one another, with all of creation. It's in chapter two of Genesis that entered in with the fall and the sin of Adam and Eve. And then what does God do? Get ready for this. He begins this rescue mission. Yep. It's a rescue mission. So the Abraham and Isaac story, we are put in touch with the faithfulness of Abraham. That's true. But more profoundly with the faithfulness of God, the keeper of the promise. So just Janine, what, I, what I'm seeing throughout is that despite, you know, some of the Israelites and, and, and what they're doing, that God continues to be involved. He continues yeah. to reach out. He continues to want to be with his creation and with those made in his image and likeness. Yes. He wants to journey with, with the his church, people. Yeah, the church wants us to remember that that didn't stop. He's always wanting to be with us yes. and is with us. You know, we looked at the Exodus story, that continual involvement in the journey of his people. You know, it was so good that Janet shared the backstory of the Israelites. I thought that was wonderful mm -hmm. how God worked through all of it, not being the cause of bad things, never, but bringing good out of all of it, bringing yeah. freedom. Yeah, and and also, you know, when we talk about, uh, she mentioned the parting of the Red, Red Sea being a baptismal symbol and and we continually see you know whether it's with creation or with the parting of the red sea or a reading that we don't even talk about but when moses hit the rock with the staff and water came out yes water a is a continual part of the motif leading to the the symbolism of baptism and we can see that now can't we yeah, when we, absolutely that's why the old testament such an important part of our whole understanding of how God works. Yes. So through these readings and those of the prophets, we can readily recognize the New Testament connections, like we just said. And these are things that the authors at the time were not aware of. Mm -hmm. This is just great gift to us when we look back and can see that how God was at work. And the last four vigil readings come from the prophets and were written either before, during, or after the exile. Mm -hmm. And Mo shared last week about the two readings from Isaiah, where we could see God's continued promise and engagement and God's desire and longing for his people. You know, I think it's worth reflecting for a minute, you know, how these readings give us a sense how much, how much God longs for, yes. desires us. You know, think of that. Even that passage in John's gospel where, where Jesus says to the woman at the well, if only you recognize God's gift. Yes. You know, and, and say a little something, Bridget, about what we were talking about with God's desire and our desire. You know, and it's God constantly being at work, you know, and, and, and trying to involve us in what he's doing. And not very different from the Israelites, you know, we're, we're human. We have the frailty. We, we are sinning, but he is constantly calling us to restoration. We grieve what we do and he grieves us in our sin, but he constantly calls us to rest restoration. And as we just said, continues that journey with us. Yeah. Didn't you tell me something about uh, something you heard at the beginning of Lynch? Uh, yes. about how we are yes. um, thank you you know we're looking for yeah um at the beginning of lent uh i was listening to a podcast and one of the members of the podcast says you know we always seek to give things up for lent to do something for god god needs me to do something for him and um the the priest said how often do we ask god what do you want to do for me what mm -hmm. do you want to do for me? And I think these readings have consistently shown us what God wants to do for us. 
continually yeah. drawing us into relationship with him. You yeah. mentioned like the thirst to abundant, you know, for abundant water, the life. It's it's all about what he wants to do yeah. and and we struggle with that sometimes in our and separating ourselves and yet he continually invites us back. Yes, yes, yes. And I think sometimes we we fall into the trap of thinking uh, it's what we do that matters. Yeah. And I'm not saying it doesn't matter, but it doesn't matter in the same way as what God does. Right. You know, we can't, uh, we can fall into the trap of think, well, if I do this, you know, then God will do that. And we, we tend to, and even Pope Francis points this out in his uh, apostolic letter on um, the joy of the gospel. You know, one of the, one of the pitfalls of our culture is um, Pelagianism, mm -hmm. which means that we think we can work our way to heaven. It's yeah. what we do. And we need to get, you know, get shaken out of that because yeah. that's part of our culture. And we have to realize that everything we do is, is really a response to what God's already done. Right. He is the doer. Right. You know, yeah. it's, it's not an easy concept for us to fully grasp. You can't put God in debt. No. God doesn't owe us anything. Exactly. We are the recipients. And so you can see in the Isaiah reading, the first one that she that she shared last week, you know, uh, grief from grief to restoration. You know, my love shall never leave you, nor my covenant of peace be shaken, mm -hmm. never. And then the all the, the, the beautiful one that has written songs about all who are thirsty come to the water. Right. Come, come, come. So yeah, there's a I, lot of baptismal connections there, huh? Exactly, and I love. I just love that that. You know, again, from the beginning of creation, baptism and water has been a consistent theme. Right. You know? So, and it's one of the uh, amazing sacraments that we will be able to celebrate at our Easter vigil this year. So. Yes, yes, yes. And we will be renewing our own a baptismal absolutely. promises, absolutely. which is like a covenant renewal time. Yes, yes. So, okay, so tonight, the two readings from Baruch and Isaiah and Ezekiel, uh, we want to just break open a little bit. Um, both, both of them prophesied during the Babylonian exile. And I didn't realize, but I found out that Baruch was actually a secretary to Jeremiah, who was mm. one of the even more widely known uh, prophets during that time. Um, so the prophets were very busy around this time because God had a lot to say. Yeah. And you know? we, I think the, for me, the exile is a little bit, um, I'm going to use the word confusing. I'm not sure if it is to everyone else. So can you give us a little bit more background about that and um, why it was such a difficult time for God, God's people? Yeah. Yeah. Well, my knowledge is limited too, but I'll share with that one. Okay. Okay. Uh, <laughs> It was a difficult time, and the prophet, especially Jeremiah, you know, they tried to warn the people ahead of time, consequences of their behavior, and they had fallen into idolatry, and that was pretty easy to do back then. There were a lot of gods around, you yeah. know, and uh, they had fallen away from the law of God that God had given them, walk my way, huh? They were no longer walking in God's way. So it was around 586 BC before Christ that the Babylonians forcibly took over the city of Jerusalem. Mm. They came in, they pillaged it, and they destroyed the temple. And they drove the Jews into exile. And the language is they were driven. And they had no choice. Sounds a lot like what's going on in the U Ukraine right now, really. Yeah. This exile, you know, back then, this left God's people without a home, as it does today, without, and wondering if God had abandoned them. Yeah, and I mean, I think it's hard for us to, to comprehend what that journey was really like. Um, and that, again, you mentioned that we see so much suffering on the news, you know, both locally nationally internationally um 
when we think about the journey from Jerusalem to um, Babylon or from Babylon, yeah, yeah, Jerusalem to Babylon, you know, we hear about Jesus walking all the time and people, but we heard about the Israelites, you know, making it to the promised land. But how long was that journey? The yeah, you know, um, I kind of wondered that myself. So I looked it up and apparently it took three or four months to get there. Oh, wow. Can you imagine? Yeah. Can you no. imagine no. what that was like? You know, I think about how did they eat? How did they go to the bathroom? I mean, these, yeah. you know, what was that? And they were being driven the whole time too. Yeah. So that was not a pleasant time. Not a pleasant time at all. So once they got there, they kind of settled in. Now they settled in the best they could. They became somewhat integrated. And somebody, I don't know who, I probably should know, but I don't. Somebody brought the Torah. Mm. Okay? And with them, and the prophets continued to challenge the people to return to the Lord. Many of them over the years remained faithful faithful to their identity as an Israelite, and they keeping up with the customs and praying together. And then relief came around 516 BC. Okay. And there are different views about that timing, but this is the one that I, I chose. The Persians conquered the Babylonians and King Cyrus of the Persians allowed the Israelites to return to Jerusalem and rebuild the temple. So they were there about 70 years, a couple generations. Wow. Yeah. So it really doesn't talk about this in scripture, but how, how many people are, I mean, it's not like a couple hundred. No, 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 no. Well, I read that about 42,000 returned. Oh, wow. Some remained because they had established businesses. Yeah. They had, you know, into the culture. Not everyone heeded the cry of the prophets. It's when they were in exile, however, that Baruch shared his prophecy that we have for the Easter Vigil reading. They had settled in somewhat by this time, and he's trying to shake them up again. You know, he's trying to tell them to do the right thing here. So we got a slide on that. Could you put that on for a second? I picked out these four points, this one here, okay? First thing he says is, how is it that you're in a land of your foes? What happened? Oh, you've forsaken the fountain of wisdom. Well, you know what? God alone, the one who knows all things, knows her. Her is wisdom. And he wants you to follow Wisdom, follow the law, walk in the way of God. Because you know what? When you walk by her light, we are blessed because we know, oh Israel, what pleases God. Hmm. Huh? What pleases God to us. So get on the boat here and do the right thing. Okay, take the slow I'll look at you. So that is that I mean Baruch is saying what prophets before him had said consistently yeah. you know yeah yeah okay right and this this particular section is kind of poetic it's like a little poem set aside almost yeah and he talks through it about the work of god throughout creation the harmony and what we talked about yeah order out of chaos you know yeah. the work of god the connection of all god has made and he praises wisdom and he aligns wisdom with the law. It was believed that the people had turned away from Yahweh and thus they experienced the exile. It was a consequence. They had forsaken the fountain of wisdom. They had forgot. They had gotten pulled into all these other gods. Yeah. At the time, they thought Yahweh was theirs alone, but everybody else had one too. They, everybody had another god, yeah. too, but they had Yahweh. At the end of the exile, that changed, and they began to realize that God was universal for all. But right now, they were just kind of in this isolated way, so they could yeah. pull from these other gods, the God of rain, the God of this, the God of, the God yeah. of this, you know? 
So they had forsaken the fountain of wisdom. They had not followed God's ways. But God is what? The persistent rescuer. Absolutely. He brings the law and wisdom together and reminds people that keeping the law reflects wisdom. When you live in wisdom, you are living in peace and joy. Yes. You are in harmony with God's way. Yeah. And again, the one who knows wisdom or the one who knows all things knows her wisdom. And yeah, you know, you, me you mentioned that the link between wisdom and, and the Lord. It, it, it just seems like, why would you not try to be wise? Why would you, and why would you fall away? Um, and this is the same wisdom that God gave to Jacob and, and to Israel. Yeah. And he continually offers it not only to those people, but as we journey, he continually offers it to us, you know, and if we walk by that, we yeah. will be closer to yeah, the Lord. Yeah. You know, and it's right around this time too, that a lot of the other books of wisdom were written like Sirach and Proverbs. And they're all, it's like homespun wisdom, you know? Yeah. I remember one line, when you sit at the table, don't be the first to reach your hand into the bowl. A word of wisdom. Yeah. I'll remember that so, if you ever invite me over that. for dinner. <laughs> yeah, I love that. But don't you just love the last line of this reading? Blessed are we, O Israel, for what pleases God is known to us. Yeah. You know, and... It's no secret what pleases God, is it? Yeah. God is ever calling us, just as he called them. Yes. Come this way, walk with me. Sure, we're in, a, we're in a discerning many times, but we're discerning to walk with. You want to choose the greater good. You know? yeah. So I don't think God is keep trying to keep a secret from us about what he wants us to do. Right. Open your heart and he'll show you. you know? Absolutely. And now this very same theme continues in the excerpt from the book of Ezekiel, but it shifts a little bit. Why don't you put that one up? Well, no, wait a minute. I gotta, let me say a few things first. Okay. This is one of the major books, uh, prophetic books also of the Old Testament. And he sets the stage in this excerpt of what, was, what has happened and what God is about to do, is, is getting ready to do about it, okay? And it's interesting because the shift becomes all that we've been talking about, about what God does, boy, he takes the reins in this reading. So I'll put, go ahead and put it up, okay? Okay. Basically, he says, you have served to profane my name among everybody. When they look at you, they say to themselves, what about their guy? Yeah. He has certainly hasn't kept his end of the bargain. So I don't look good. And I don't like not looking good. This is what God says. <laughs> In my holy name. So I'm going to have to take the reins here. And I will prove the holiness. These are the things I'm going to do. I'm going to take you away from among them. I'm going to sprinkle clean water on you. I'm going to cleanse you. I will give you a new heart. I will put my spirit within you. You will be my people and I will be your God. This is what I'm going to do. So get ready. And of course, it's from then that they, they go back to Jerusalem and rebuild the temple. But what is this saying to us? All of this is God's. And it's given to us as well as to them. Do you see? Yes. And yes. here it is, the last of the Old Testament readings. And we're getting ready to jump into the celebration of baptism, yes. the resurrection, and what God has done here. The gift of holy baptism and the life of the Spirit, the new life of the Spirit. This is what God is doing. And this yes. is what we are about to celebrate as we enter into this Easter vigil. It yeah. is so profound, it blows your mind. Yeah. So I hope that every single person whose little square is on my screen <laughs> plans to come to the Easter Vigil. You will not 
regret it. It's Absolutely. the high point of the year. It is the, the peak of what we're about as Catholic Christians. Absolutely. So I think that's all I want to say about that. Well, and, and just to go back to your slide, when you talked about the sprinkling of clean water, baptism, yeah. I'll cleanse you, baptism. I will give you a new heart, baptism and confirmation. I will put my spirit in you, confirmate. I mean, everything about what has led up to this point is so sacramental and, yes. and so affirming of who God is and how much he wants relationship with us, not only as individuals, but also as community. So, um, well, you know what, Bridget, I think that, um, I've always loved the old Testament, but I, I, I love it even more having of this series. And I, I found out, and I think it's true that prior to the second Vatican council, and I don't remember back that far, you know what I'm saying? But prior to that, I think we heard from the Testament at our liturgies. Yeah. That was part of the new liturgy. We missed it. Yeah. And look at how rich it is, huh? Oh, and it just, you know, we've learned through through these five meetings how integrated the Old Testament and the New Testament is. And we understand now when, when Jesus pulls something out of the Old Testament, what it means and how he built on yeah. it. And he did yeah. not come to, uh, you know, abolish, abolish the law, no. but fulfill the law. So, okay. so much is coming out of this. So, yep. and I will echo uh, what Janine says. If you have never been to the Easter Vigil, come. Um, it It is just a such an amazing experience and so sacramental and so beautiful. And, you know, from the lighting of the candle in the commons to the lighting of the candles in the community to the, re it's just, and it's just beautiful. And you would benefit from it and it would be a Absolutely. great, great time. So thank you as always. I, I have the best seat in the house for this and you know, <laughs> you and Mo and Janet and soon to be Kathy just make it amazing. So thank you very, very much. Well, thank you. It's a, it's a privilege.